Uh, as I said, we're talking today about a presentation of a piece of work that's jointly funded by both the Deep South National Science Challenge and our Land and Water National Science Challenge, and it also ties into some of the work that's done in my team as well, which is now some of the sustainable land management and climate change. So, but before we go any further, I want to invite Andrea Halliday, Director of the uh, Deep South National Science Challenge, to come up and just say a few minutes. So, as Neil said, I'm Angela Holiday. I'm the director of the Deep South National Science Challenge, and I'm going to do a brief intro of the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge. Just a quick show of hands. Are people aware of the National Science Challenges, what they do? So, we've got a okay, pretty good understanding of them. So, that's great. There's 11 National Science Challenges, and we represent two of them. And our actual speaker is Mike. So, I just wanted to. Um, introduce the Deep South National Science Challenge and the Our Land and Water National Science Challenge. The Deep South, the name is very confusing, I know, especially for me, I roll my R's and I'm from Southland, so everyone thought I was moving back to Southland, but it is actually about um, climate change research, in particular adaptation, um, and the Our Land and Water mission is to improve New Zealand's freshwater quality while also enhancing the value of the primary sector. Um, so the Deep South touches on primary sector, but it also touches on basically everything else you can think of in terms of climate change adaptation, which is separate to mitigation. So we're not really concerned at this stage, that's your guys' deal, about reducing emissions. We're about how New Zealand is going to adapt to a changing climate. Um, other projects that may be of interest, as well as Anne Gales in this challenge, from a primary sector point of view, include, so we've got a project looking at drought the effect of drought on rural communities, a project looking at the impact climate change will have on the national water cycle, the impact of climate on our frozen water resources, in particular glacier melt and how that's going to affect flows, um, robust decision making for water infrastructure investment and national flood risks and climate change. So they all touch on um, what's going to impact the primary sector with climate change. Um, with our land and water, this research is part of the land use suitability program. Um, it aims to provide options for land uses that meet water quality and greenhouse gas obligations, helping landowners decide what to grow, where to grow it, and the consequences and trade-offs of their land use choices. And it will also contribute to tools and development under Neil's watchful eye, um, such as the SLIP, and you're familiar with that acronym, Sustainable Land Use Information Portal, <coughs> and augment some tools that are already in use. Um, the aim is within the next two years to have producers, planners, and policy makers able to use these tools to inform land use decisions that are sustainable and profitable in the long term. So that's a brief overview of um, where we're hoping this research will get, but I'll hand over to Inga for the details. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Angela. So my name is uh, Angel Ose. I'm from uh, Manaiki Fenua Lenke Research. And first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the uh, team members and co-authors uh, for this project, uh, coming from uh, Ag Research, Plant and Food Research, uh, GNS, and also the University of uh, Waikato. I would also like to thank uh, the two National Science Challenge, uh, the Deep South and Our Land and Water, for that project that was really one of the, I think it's one of the only one that is a cross-challenge uh, project. So first, I wanted to uh, um, go back to the, the uh, definition and the <coughs> principles behind the land use suitability. Uh, as Angela said, it's really here um, to inform decision makers and farmers about the consequences of uh, some of the land use uh, choices that they could make. It's uh, developed by our land and water, and it's got four main components to think about uh, uh, the choices for and options for land use. Uh, the first one is looking at uh, whether a land use choice may be environmentally uh, desirable. So looking at the impacts on the envir environment in terms of relative contribution and pressure that it, it might create. The second one is whether it's uh, socially or culturally uh, desirable, so looking at the community and the land users' objectives. But it's also looking at whether it's uh, biophysically uh, feasible. Uh, can I grow a crop in that uh, land? Uh, so we're looking at an indicator on uh, productive potential. And the last one, uh, very important as well, is uh, looking at the uh, economic uh, feasibility in terms of profit, uh, labor, and uh, infrastructure. But 
uh, climate change will affect uh, that uh, framework in the sense that uh, all those commons, components will be affected by climate change. So in our project, we uh, mainly looked at uh, two things, um, the components around environmental desirability uh, and uh, biophysical uh, feasibility. So these are the two components that we uh, focused on uh, during our project. But first, I just wanted to remind people about uh, the different climate change uh, projection um, coming from NIWA in terms of long-term uh, projection into the future. So everyone uh, knows by now that uh, it's projected to get hotter uh, everywhere in New Zealand, uh, drier in summer uh, with less precipitation, uh, and wetter in uh, winter, but people may not realize that it's uh, also predicted to be spatially variable. So um, the winter uh, um, precipitation might be uh, stronger, especially in the south of the South Island and uh, the west side of, uh, of New Zealand. Um, the other interesting uh, outputs from NIWA is uh, the projected changes in extremes uh, with more hot days in summer. But again, it's spatially viable with more hot days, mainly in the northern part of the North Island, and less cold days, again, uh, more um, affected areas in the, in the south of the South Island. Um, and the other aspect that is uh, really interesting as well is um, the projected changes in uh, extreme events. Um, it's got more uncertainty around that, but what we can see is that it's predicted to have more intense rainfall in the south of the South Island. And the time spent in drought is also expected to uh, double or, or triple uh, by mid-century and affecting uh, areas uh, like in the eastern side of uh, New Zealand and the northern side. So. That gives you a context a little bit of uh, what uh, the climate change um, uh, might uh, do in the future. Um, but what we've done in this project is uh, looking at how it might impact on, uh, on the primary sector. So it was a two-year project um, that finished last year, so quite a short project. And it had two goals that had to um, fulfill the two visions from uh, both the Deep South and uh, our land and water. So we had two objectives. The first one was to explore the future climate change uh, impacts in terms of uh, long term and uh, drought. We were also interested in uh, drought, so we are looking at one extreme event. And uh, so to uh, fit with the vision from the Deep South. And the second goal was to look at uh, identifying the climate attributes that might influence both the productive potential, but also the environmental impacts. This is to fit within that land use suitability framework that I talked about, and this is that is uh, being developed by our land and water. So um, we couldn't do everything in two years, so we had to choose which uh, land use we would uh, uh, focus on. So we looked at the different sectors uh, in New Zealand, and um, we thought that we would focus on three uh, land use uh, uh, sectors, um, looking at the sheep and beef uh, pasture system, uh, maize wheat rotation, and uh, wine grapes. And the reason is that we wanted to have examples in uh, the three main sectors for uh, pastoral systems, arable cropping systems, and also horticultural uh, perennial uh, crop systems. So, Thank you. Um, so this is a complicated uh, slide, but I just wanted to um, explain uh, the methods and the scale of uh, the analysis uh, for our, <coughs> our project. Um, in our team, we had a range of uh, uh, biophysical modelers, uh, which means that we had uh, access to a range of, uh, um, of models. Uh, ranging from the APSIM model uh, that is uh, been calibrated and uh, is being developed by AgriSearch and uh, Plant and Food. So it's mainly focusing on uh, pastoral system and arable systems. It's very complex. Um, it's got uh, the advantage of looking at uh, different management uh, uh, practices. It does include uh, the CO2 fertilization effects, so the fact that plants might be more uh, water efficient in their use. 
Uh, but because it's highly complex, we could only uh, look at uh, uh, applying it at uh, some points in the landscape. So we chose three points in the Hawke's Bay, one in the Hawke's Bay, one in the Waikato, and one in the South Lawn. And we tried to look at two contrasting soils in those uh, three areas. Then we had some tier two um, type of models um, that are less complex and less hungry in terms of data inputs. That's the Biome BGC model that has been calibrated uh, for uh, pastoral systems. Um, and we looked uh, at uh, it in a regional context. So we were interested in uh, uh, the Hawke's Bay region because it's more prone to drought. Um, so the management information is uh, less uh, data hungry. It's got some information on, uh, it's including the CO2 fertilization uh, effect. The next level down is the water yield model. It's a simple water balance, balance model. It doesn't have the CO2 fertilization effect, um, but it can be applied uh, at regional or even a national scale. And uh, <coughs> the good thing about it is that you can look across different uh, land use types. And then there's a, a tier one type of models that are more the um, uh, climate uh, indices. So it's really just using the inputs from NIWA and uh, creating some, uh, uh, some other um, climate related uh, information. It's very low in terms of uh, inputs, but at least you can apply it uh, nationally and have an idea about trends uh, at national scale. So I'll show you some uh, of the results um, for uh, first the first goal around uh, exploring uh, future climate change impacts. So what I'm going to show you is some um, outputs for um, the aspects around productive potential uh, with uh, aspects around uh, pasture production, uh, but also uh, was interested in uh, animal heat stress. Um, I'll show you some examples of uh, results from the maize uh, wheat uh, production um, and also for wine grape. We didn't have a biophysical model uh, to look at uh, how the yield might change. So we just look at a, a simple phenological model. And for the environmental impacts, if you can push that button, that'd be good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we also uh, had to uh, restrict ourselves to what we had available. Um, and we had access to the outputs from EPSIM in terms of uh, nitrate leaching uh, loss for, uh, from pasture and maize. And the last uh, one that we looked at was the uh, aspect around water demand. Um, and in that case, we we'll, I'll show you some outputs from the Biome BGC and the, the water model, uh, the water yield, uh, water balance model. But first, um, although it was a two-year project, it was building on uh, uh, another research project that had finished uh, at the time uh, called the Climate Change Impacts and Implication Research Program. It was led by uh, Manaki Fenua and uh, Niwa. And during that project, uh, we al already uh, had uh, applied the, the Biome BGC model for, uh, for uh, pastoral systems. And what is shown here is the results uh, showing the uh, impact of climate change uh, at the end of the century uh, for, uh, on annual pasture production. And I talked about the CO2 fertilization effect. It's really important and that's where we've got the most uh, uh, uncertainty probably about uh, the uh, level of um, uh, impact for that CO2 fertilization. But on the left, you've got the two projections for a, a sheep and beef and a dairy farm system uh, without uh, CO2 fertilization. And on the right, you've got the same thing, but accounting for that CO2 fertilization effect. And what is shown here is that if you account for this, and it's likely to happen in the future, um, we can see an increase in uh, pasture production across the country. Um, which is not shown if you don't take it in, into account. So it's quite important and that's uh, one of the big uncertainty in, uh, in science at the moment. So bear it in mind. Um, but what we've done in this project is we try to dig, a, dig a, a bit deeper than just the annual production and look at uh, what does it mean uh, for uh, pastoral systems. And here 
is shown um, an example of re results from the APSIM uh, modeling uh, for the, uh, our point in the Waikato for one soil, the Tekofi soil. And we analyze the results on a monthly basis, looking at the pasture growth rate um, for the current um, climate, um, mid-century and uh, end-of-century uh, uh, simulations. And what you can see is the dashed line is just a repeat of that uh, current line, just to compare uh, what might happen to, uh, between current and mid-century simulation and uh, current versus uh, end-of-century simulations. So what's shown here is basically that uh, although the annual uh, production might increase, um, there's a strong seasonal shift with um, more um, pastoral uh, growth rate during the spring months, uh, but lower pasture growth rate uh, during uh, summer. And what is not shown here is that um, because we compare different regions and different soils, uh, we could also see that uh, this was very variable in depending on the soils, uh, the regions, but also the climate models. As you can see, there's a, a big spread of uh, data uh, due to the different uh, climate models. And so we think that it's really important because uh, this might influence uh, a farmer's decision on, uh, on feedstock and uh, how they manage it. Yep. So um, the other aspect that we looked at uh, in the pastoral system was uh, how um, the livestock or the animals might be affected. Um, in this case, we use a simple uh, climate uh, index uh, that I think is already used by farmers. It's the temperature humidity index um, to get a sense of the level of risk uh, for, for heat stress on, uh, on livestock. Here I'm showing uh, um, two sets of maps. Um, one looking at the moder moderate uh, heat stress uh, for today and in the future, uh, mid-century and end of century and also a severe heat stress uh, today and in the future. So as we can see, the change in number of days uh, that uh, would have a heat stress uh, is likely to increase, uh, affecting most of New Zealand uh, for moderate, moderate heat stress. But for severe heat stress, uh, it seems to be concentrated on uh, regions like uh, uh, Canterbury, Warapa or uh, central uh, Waikato. So something to keep in mind if uh, there's a need for more shade or shelter for, for animals. So now I'm going to talk about uh, some of the results uh, for a cropping system. Uh, as I said, we focused on a rotation between a, a spring summer crop uh, covered in maize and an autumn winter crop, a catch crop uh, of wheat. And again, um, we are building on research that was done during the climate change impacts and implication uh, research program, where um, the APSI model was uh, uh, applied across the landscape uh, for uh, one system, an irrigated uh, maize production system, uh, one RCB, so the, the highest uh, uh, emission trajectory, and one uh, climate model. And we, what we can see is that uh, this is the current situation where there's a, a lower yield of maize in the south and a higher in the north. But in future, what might happen is that there might be a relative uh, increase in, the, in the, the south of the South Island compared to a, a decrease in yield um, in the North Island. But what was also interesting is that uh, because it's using APSIM, we can also play on the management options and adaptation of uh, farmers. And if we take into account some level of adaptation, again, it's all simulated, uh, we could see that uh, the effect is kind of uh, compensated. Uh, we can compensate the, the loss of, uh, of yield. Yes. Um, and one of the adaptation uh, measures that could be done is uh, to uh, the sowing date. So how um, the farmers may decide to sow earlier because the temperature accumulation may reach a, a threshold earlier in the year. And this is shown here. So here I'm showing two examples uh, in the Waikato and the Hawke's Bay. And the results are similar in both um, areas. Um, and 
I'm showing the results for maize um, during the summer and uh, the cover crop uh, wheat during the winter. And what's interesting is that compared to today's um, situation, with the different uh, climate scenarios, there's a shift in the, the sowing date, so it goes earlier uh, by uh, nearly two weeks by the end of uh, the century. Uh, but that has a consequence as well on the sowing date for the wheat, uh, the catch crop uh, um, wheat as well, which means that as a consequence, there might be a, a longer growth period, period for the wheat. And it's shown that there might be higher yields uh, during winter uh, coming from uh, wheat uh, production. Now, wine. This is close to my heart, so I just <laughs> wanted to, to show that as well. I'm French, right? So, um, first, I just wanted to explain the different uh, growth stages uh, for a uh, wine grape. So, um, in terms of uh, um, phenology, so in terms of definitions. So a grape uh, goes through uh, phases of a uh, bud burst, uh, flowering at the end of spring, then the veraison, which is the ripening of the grape, uh, and then harvest. And between the uh, ripening and harvest, that's when the, the grape are accumulating all the sugars. And what is shown, and this is from a, a colleague uh, from um, uh, Lincoln University, Amber Parker, and she's done a lot of work on this, what is shown is that the thermal accumulation is uh, what's affecting the most uh, the timing of uh, that, uh, those uh, growth uh, stages. So what we thought we would do is uh, we could look at Amber's uh, 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 empirical relationship between uh, the cumulative uh, temperature and uh, the growth stages and look at how climate change by impact on, on the, the flowering dates. And this is what's shown here. So um, again, I'm separating <coughs> mid-century from uh, end of century um, simulations. Um, and I'm looking at just one cultivar, uh, Pinot Noir, because I like it, um, <laughs> in central Otago, um, and looking at uh, the uh, date of flowering. So um, this is uh, uh, the current uh, flowering date and the different climate scenario being with uh, RCP 8.5 being the worst or the highest uh, trajectory uh, for emissions. And what you can see again, there's a shift in flowering dates up to a week by end of uh, mid-century and uh, nearly two weeks by, uh, by the end of the century. This is, uh, uh, from my understanding, uh, from Amber, very important because it might have implications on the, the raison and also on the, uh, the uh, sugar uh, contents uh, for, for those grapes. But what's interesting as well is that we also started uh, very recently, actually, uh, comparing um, the three major cultivars in New Zealand in three different regions. So I'm not comparing the same cultivar, but I thought we could look at um, a Merlot in the Hawke's Bay, uh, Pinot Noir in central Otago, and Sauvignon Blanc in the Marlborough, and look at those shifts in flowering dates. And what we see is that the range of um, flowering dates might be quite large right now, but it might still start to be compressed in the future, which also has implications in terms of uh, harvesting uh, scheduling uh, and um, yeah, uh, how to schedule um, in and across uh, New Zealand. So it's an un un uh, intended uh, consequences of climate change. Yeah. Um, so that was for the productive potential and what might happen to uh, different sectors. But we also wanted to look at uh, the environment, how it might be affected. And in this case, we looked at uh, the results from APSIM in terms of nitrate leaching. This is uh, harder to interpret, but um, looking at the different simulations, we saw that there seems to be some, uh, it tends to be higher with the uh, climate change, if you like, uh, nitrate leaching in the three regions. But what we can see mainly is uh, a lot of uh, interannual uh, viability. So it's really dependent on, uh, on, uh, on the um, uh, climate viability. What we've seen, though, is that in the Southland case, uh, there seems to be higher um, significant uh, changes in terms of nitrate leaching uh, in that uh, particular point. Um, that's something that we still need to understand. 
Um, what we found as well, and this is something we already know, is that uh, the nitrate leaching rates uh, tend to be lower in soils that had a higher uh, water holding capacity. So that means that it's really hard to make a sweeping statements about nitrate leaching because uh, soil will have a much higher impacts um, than climate change. And the last aspect, I think I've got another uh, point, um, is that Yes, we also looked, uh, here I was just talking about the pastoral systems, uh, but for the, the maize uh, wheat uh, production system, uh, what was interesting, and I'm not showing it here, is that there might be a higher nitrogen uptake uh, by wheat by the catch crop during winter, which might be pointing towards uh, the importance of a catch crop uh, during winter. Now, change in water demand is uh, in everybody's mind, and um, unfortunately, it's not looking that good <laughs> for the future. Um, here, I'm showing uh, maps coming from the Biome BGC uh, model. Um, it's a map uh, showing the potential evapotranspiration uh, deficit. Uh, it's a nice full, but it's just uh, an indicator of uh, potential water limitation in the future. And you can see here in the Hawkes Bay that compared to uh, today, which is already uh, 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 water limited, there might be even more water limitation uh, with climate change. What we can see is also there seems to be some uh, spatial uh, viability. So once again, I think it's pointing towards the importance of uh, the different soils. Um, and unfortunately, yes, for the Hawkes Bay, um, it's uh, probably will have some implications for irrigation demand in a region that is already uh, uh, prone to drought. What we've done as well is uh, looking at the, the simpler uh, water balance model, uh, because we also wanted to look at uh, the differences between uh, different uh, crop covers. And also uh, looking at the two other regions, uh, the Waikato and uh, Southland. Again, you can see the same indicator, um, potential evapotranspiration deficit um, going up. So there's an increase in water demand uh, in our two case studies in the Waikato and the Southland. But um, in this case, it was relatively more important in, uh, in the Waikato. Once again, same conclusion, lots of variability due to soil and uh, different climate models. As you can see, those box plots are really, really wide. Now, as I said, I had, um, we had two goals in this project. The first one was uh, the biggest one, really, was looking at the, the climate change impacts. Um, but we also uh, wanting to include um, the, incorporate the climate change aspect into the land use suitability concept that is developed by our land and water. So to rephrase that, uh, the question is whether we can attribute um, some of the complex model results to some simpler uh, metrics because, as I said, uh, running AppSim is very time consuming, it's uh, uh, resource intensive, it's uh, asking for really skillful biophysical modelers, uh, it's really specific to a few land use types, um, but our land and water is really looking at across different land use types, so we really need to have a way of simplifying the framework. So what we've done is we've done a, a statistical analysis, uh, trying to look at uh, what could explain the variance uh, in terms of pasture production, and what's the most important uh, parameter that explains that variance. So if you compare the two models, uh, uh, APSIM and BIOMBGC, it seems like um, the water-related indices and the soil types are really the main uh, aspects that are uh, explaining variance in the pasture production. But there is also some aspects of uh, some climate attributes uh, that are also explaining that variance. And if we go into details for those climate attributes, and these are preliminary results at this stage, um, we saw that uh, things like precipitation in summer of uh, two months, so January, February, uh, seems to have a good correlation with pasture production. Number of hot days as well. And for maize, uh, we had the thermal accumulation that was a good uh, predictor of, uh, of the, that viability in yield. And for nitrate leaching, um, again, uh, really hard to understand that viability, but uh, it looks like the intense precipitation uh, in spring 
uh, over three months was a, a good uh, indicator of uh, the viability of nitrate leaching. And in my mind, I think that's what's uh, explaining the, um, the higher nitrate leaching that we noticed in Southland, because uh, the climate change projection from NIWA are uh, uh, projecting a higher uh, intense rainfall in, uh, in that region. So, lots of results, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, but if there's one thing you may want to remember in a snapshot, um, the future climate uh, change impacts for the pastoral system, uh, remember that the annual production might increase, but with uh, implications in terms of uh, seasonal shifts. Animal stress, uh, heat stress might increase. For maize production, we can um, uh, maintain the production if we incorporate some uh, adaptation in terms of uh, sowing dates. Uh, there may be more production from uh, wheat during winter. I've talked about the wine grape uh, phenology uh, shift. And for the nitrate leaching, uh, it seems like the uh, extreme events, so the uh, extreme rainfall is what's uh, mostly increasing the risk of uh, nitrate leaching. But that could be some good things uh, from a better uptake from, uh, from catch crops. And summer water demand are uh, likely to increase, especially in the Waikato. Uh, it's already there in the Hawke's Bay. It's going to get worse, but I guess they already know about that. And the last thing is uh, we need probably to explore this a bit further, but um, climate attributes uh, might be um, uh, identified to be used as uh, proxies. And what I wanted to show uh, next is um, I think what's uh, important to remember is more the implications of uh, that work, that it's all pointing towards the need for a long-term uh, um, strategy uh, adaptation. Um, as I said, for pasture and livestock, um, and it's already an issue right now, but there's, there's going to be even more need to better manage uh, water and nutrients, and possibly uh, invest in more shade or shelter for, for animals. For maize, uh, I've already talked about some adaptation options like uh, sowing dates or genotypes. And for wine grapes, it may be that in the future we need to adapt uh, cultivars, think about a uh, harvesting schedule. Um, but on the bright side, uh, it might be um, warmer and meaning that it might open up more uh, suitable areas for, for wine grapes. So, we are now entering change two of uh, this project. Um, so it's been approved to continue that type of work that is a cross-challenge work. Uh, we'll continue working on uh, uh, the climate attributes that are influencing uh, productive potential across uh, a range of land use types. Uh, but most importantly, and it's, um, to me, I feel like it's more important to think about understanding the risk for the primary sector. And by this, I mean <laughs> uh, using um, a framework that is uh, already being used by uh, IPCC, uh, with risk being um, a combination of um, hazards, uh, such as the frost occurrence, uh, drought or flood, exposure, so where the land, user, land users are, um, and also vulnerability. So Vulnerability is uh, composed of uh, sensitivity, so I've already mentioned the growth stages or the livestock uh, heat tolerance, for instance, but also the adaptive capacity. So how far can a farmer go in terms of uh, what are the, his management options? It could be sowing days, it could be irrigation or not. Maybe in some um, aspect like sheep and beef, uh, irrigation is not an option. So we also need to understand that uh, adaptive capacity. And to me, what's important is to identify the hotspots at risk and uh, inform uh, adaptation strategies, such as the uh, National uh, Climate Change Risk Assessment that is being uh, developed by, uh, by MFE. I've got one more slide, just to explain, because uh, again, wine grape is close to my heart. But I just wanted to uh, uh, show an example of uh, climate change risk and compounding effects. So if you click, I've already talked about the change in flowering dates. Um, but it might also shift uh, harvesting dates and um, uh, coincide with hot days, which might affect uh, labor uh, conditions uh, during harvest, uh, also wine quality, because uh, the sugar content may also change. It might 
uh, take less time to, to, um, to accumulate sugar and it might affect uh, acidity or uh, acid um, alcohol levels. So in brief, I think it's important to uh, identify all, all the risks, but also looking at the uh, interaction between uh, the different uh, aspects, long-term shifts and also uh, um, extreme events. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Inga. Fascinating. Do we have any questions for Inga? question on the CO2 fertilization, what is that? Um, well, as you know, with climate change, uh, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is increasing. Yeah. And um, it looks like, uh, and I'm not an expert in this area, but it looks like the, um, it's uh, going to affect the photosynthesis and, and plants. And uh, it looks like um, uh, it's already affected uh, based on the historical data set, if you like. Um, that uh, with more CO2, there might be more photosynthesis and more um, productive uh, plants, basically. So it means that they're, they're more active and more um, producing more biomass. Yeah. Um, if you get the tranche three, which would be great, um, would you consider something like the effects of climate change on biodiversity? And the reason why I ask that is because you've got the primary industry sector, uh, industries occupying land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, so it's good that you're looking at um, how they'll manage um, to sort out uh, you know, nutrients and water and get that. Yeah. Um, adapt to climate change and all of that. But I guess there's another lens to lay over that, what you might do with that land and yeah. how that might respond in terms of biodiversity. Yeah. Well, it's a good question, and this is something that has been uh, discussed uh, in terms of the scope of those national science challenges. Uh, Deep South being climate change, uh, biological heritage, uh, looking more at the biodiversity and biosecurity aspects. Uh, I must say that I think that that aspect in particular it seems to be dropping a little bit in between uh, the cracks. Uh, uh, I believe it's important, but... Um, <coughs> It's not in the scope of what uh, we're doing in Trench too, unfortunately. Um, so we may need to find other sources of funding, like MB, for instance, or um, other aspects. No other questions? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Could you look at the impact of this change on pests associated with this process? Like pest yeah. So. We, we've done that during the previous research project, the climate change impacts and implication. Uh, Scion in particular, uh, Andrew Dunningham, has done some work on uh, looking at uh, the change in uh, suitability for pest and disease uh, with climate change. Um, but we couldn't, um, it's really hard to incorporate it and look at uh, how the pest and disease may, uh, may really change uh, uh, the levels of productions. So we couldn't look at that. Um, but this, again, this is another area that would be uh, really interesting to, to continue. Uh. Uh, you mentioned climate attributes may be used as proxy. Would a, it be decided on which climate attributes? Not yet. No, no. The, those uh, results are shown with the statistical analysis were uh, really preliminary. Um, <laughs> And it was just looking at pasture and uh, maize. And I'm thinking that uh, in other crop system, it might not be the ones that uh, were selected. So I think we need to, to explore a bit more how, uh, which proxies we should use. But the growing degree there is one that uh, people are, are aware of. It seems to be a, a good uh, proxy in the sense that I think we should explore more. <laughs> <laughs>